detrimental to self-sufficiency to have big daddy government step in and put a bandage over every boo-boo. Do you feel like they're two Americas? Absolutely. Do you think this country is divided? Absolutely. Clearly along ideological political lines. You're either a progressive and you want a big daddy government to run your life, or you're a freedom-loving American and big daddy government it needs to get out of your life. One of those two things is the dichotomy where we're at. We're in an epic battle for the soul of the United States right now. When we first opened up after Harvey, we were serving 2,000 people an hour until we closed. And then the hour Despite all the talk about political tribalism, everywhere I went, at the end of the day, they always invited me to dinner. Wow. By his hands, we are fit. Thank you, Lord, for our day Harvey has brought a change in so many of us. The beauty of it was that it brought us all together. We were all in one mind and one accord, determined that we were going to work together and make this city come back to be the way it used to be. I feel in my heart that God is trying to wake us up. So you don't believe in global warming? No. Why did God flood your town and make you all homeless? Um, read the Bible. I mean, what did he do with Sodom and Gomorrah? Um, look, I mean, he warned Noah. And, and um, I'm not saying that God, he allows things to happen. So why did God flood your town? The Bible is clear that storms will come. So I don't believe that God did this to me. I, I believe that God has, is with us during the storm. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And he will see us through despite the storms that come in our life. The Word of God says that we're, we're going to have signs and wonders that's going to start to happen in the last days. I believe that Harvey was a, um, a sign of the times, but I don't think it was Armageddon, of course. I think that's down the way. It's coming. I do believe that's going to happen in, in our world. We'll see it. But I don't think Harvey was um, Armageddon, no. But it does feel like the end times around here. Well, that's only because you got to keep looking up, sis. I'm believing that our city, yeah, it got flooded, but you know what? We said it got baptized. My son said it, and I believe it's true. Baptism is when the old man dies and the new man rises, and I'm believing that's the same thing for Port Arthur, Texas. It was flooded, yes, but we're calling it baptized. All the old things that need to be washed away is gone, and it's going to rise up to be the best, greatest city that's ever been before. That's what I believe. We say it's climate change. They say it's God's will. And even though the Bible doesn't mention greenhouse gas emissions, we will undoubtedly continue to disagree about this until the end times. While towns like this wait to be reborn, many look to President Trump to alleviate their economic anxiety. But that's not the only reason why they support him. Many Southerners told me that they feel like their culture is being threatened. And Donald Trump acknowledged the cultural anxiety of feeling like a stranger in your own country. The United States of America, the modern United States of America, has a stubborn problem with neo-Nazism and overt, violent white supremacy. Southern culture is frequently symbolized by Confederate markers that you can see all across the South. And the debate over Confederate iconography has become one of the ways we debate race in America today. This is Charlottesville the college town that became ground zero of America's race war when a group of neo-Nazis came to town to protest the city council's decision to remove the Robert E. Lee statue. When they clashed with counter-protesters, the president blamed everyone involved, empowering the white nationalists. I think there's blame on both sides. You had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. After the cameras left, the city council voted to cover the statues with black tarps until the court decides that these statues should be removed.
How do you feel about taking the statue down? I think the statue should stay. I don't think the statue should go anywhere. You know, I, I don't want my son to think that just because everybody else doesn't like something that somebody can come in and tear it down. I want my son to grow up to know that, you know, whether it's good or bad, our past is our past and it's happened. I feel that they put that there for a reason. You know, just because one set of people don't like it doesn't mean we need to tear it down. I mean, that's just somebody else's belief. You know, I mean, as much money has been put into this whole situation with this statue, we got vets sleeping on benches here. You know, I mean, why don't you guys put some effort into helping the, the veterans that can't find a place to live or a job or something like that instead of doing this dumb shit where you're tearing statues down. I mean, it makes no sense to me. What you're saying is just because you defend the statue doesn't mean you're a racist. Yeah, just because I'm bald-headed and have a goatee doesn't make me a redneck. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I believe in just as much as everybody else does. Um, I, I just don't feel that our, our history should be affected by the opinions of people in one town. We're at a crossroad anyway, the strange times that we're living in, so. What do you mean, crossroads? Nobody wants to see color, but if you're white, then you're on the downside, I guess, you know, that, I don't know, that we're the ones giving up everything and everybody else is gaining, so it's just interesting. And so we came here from North Carolina just to see it, you know, to see a big old bag. What do you think this is a symbol of? The South. So what is it that you think people don't understand about the South? Is that we wanted to be our own country <laughs> at one time, you know, and I think it would have been fine if there would have been a North and South the United States. Why should we protect these monuments? Because they're veterans' monuments. I'm doing it on the size of these are American veterans. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson are certainly American veterans. The Confederate statue behind us, that's a veteran statue. And so to us, the Southerners, is a very personal situation. It sounds like you're still fighting the Civil War here. Well, it's real to us. Particularly somebody who's come trying to take these statues down that represents your family who died. Many of the places here, the blood stains are still on the ground, so to speak. In other words, they are still there. They're sacred places to us. These monuments were put up by grieving people who had just had a devastating war. And look at Love makes memory eternal. They were grieving. This is a grieving situation here. You don't destroy the past just because you don't like it or you haven't read about it. We're not the Taliban. We don't tear down uh, statues and monuments to people who come before us. We learn from our history and we celebrate our history. For me, it's a censorship issue. That's one of the first things that personally occurred to me. My God, what do you mean take the monuments down? This is like book burning. Um, I, I can't believe we're even talking about that, that it's okay just to, for a small group of people to tell me what I can see. If you try to talk about history and lack of censorship and so on, then you're just a racist. Anyone who disagrees with these people is a racist and a white supremacist, and that has effectively silenced moderate voices in this community. They're literally afraid to show up. Are you a racist? No, I'm not racist. Are you a white supremacist? No, I'm not a white supremacist. I'm a preservationist. And our position is you don't tear things down. You add to the narrative. You add to what's there. Uh, you enhance what is there. You contextualize what is there. And if you remove those statues, you've taken away a piece of Charlottesville for uh, ideological reasons and reasons that don't reflect the reality of what was happening in Charlottesville when those statues went up or what has happened in the almost 100 years since then. Charlottesville's turned into a hashtag. Oh, yes. <laughs> People think of Charlottesville and they think of Nazis marching in the streets. That's because we probably have had them, <laughs> you know, but let's stop just thinking about the hashtag and start thinking. I think it is the absolute duty of every citizen in this country to thoroughly understand the people who disagree with you. You cannot understand them in a hashtag environment. I often think that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those various social media, they're destroying democracy because they're destroying our ability to talk to one another face to face in a rational way.
not ordered those tarps to come off in Charlottesville. So now those Confederate statues stand as a testimony to our nation's ideological divide. No one was ever under the illusion that the scars of racism healed in this country. But that fringy group of neo-Nazis reminded us that hate is still alive and well in America. And cable news is escalating the conflict by pouring fuel on the fire, continuing to feed us this narrative that we're a nation at war with ourselves. Everywhere you go, people are just regurgitating this. Right versus left, Hollywood versus the heartland, faith-based versus secular, haves versus have-nots, natives versus the undocumented. We live on opposite sides of a political divide, and the wall runs through it. To be or not to be is the $64,000 question still at hand. We're going to have strong borders. We're going to have the wall. We're building the wall. We're building the wall, folks. We're building the wall. We're going to build the wall. It's going to be built. Mexico is going to pay for the wall. To ensure that my own kids learn how to think outside the bubble, I'm taking them to see the wall. Build that wall. The wall just got 10 feet higher. Leon Trump's welcome in the community. You are it. He's landing in Brownfield in less than an hour, most likely. And he's heading to that border, and he's going to look at those walls. I don't disagree with immigration at all, but I do agree that you need to know who it is that's coming into the country. We need to protect our country. we got a lot of people here that shouldn't be here. So far, I think President Trump is the greatest president in my lifetime. This is the day that Trump's base had been waiting for. The president is here to check out the prototypes of his infamous wall. Build the wall, build the wall, 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet tall. Build the wall, build the wall, 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet tall. Build the wall, build the wall, 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet tall. Build the wall, build the wall, 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet tall. Build the wall. God bless Donald Trump for coming to this state. The leftist communist anti-Americans that are in this state that are demonizing him, shame on you. But God bless our patriots for coming out. God bless our president. Build the wall. Protect American citizens first. Protect American sovereignty first. Restore the rule of law. And we will take this country back. I want to stop right there. Restore the rule of law. We here at the Windmill Ministries Missions believes that that has become a conflict of interest pertaining to the majority of the Americans simply because they don't understand what law. There's the law of God. There's the law of man in the United States. If you go to other countries, they have different laws. But the most important law, we believe, is the law of the Native American pertaining to being a being a good steward, and it speaks of this in the Bible, of the land. And whenever you're not that good steward, that's whenever harsh things happen, such as incredible hurricanes, incredible droughts, incredible fires. I personally have been a supporter for Donald Trump going on now two plus years since he stepped off into the, the arena. I felt like, or we felt like, um, that he had our better interest at heart. But since he has recently went to the Veterans 100 Year Anniversary, I don't forgot now where it was at, I think it was over in Germany, and since we have reevaluated his motives, we're beginning to wonder about his true intent. Especially 
whenever he speaks of himself as being an internationalist, in which there's two different equations are two different interpretations of the word nationalist. And that's just in the American grain. If you look up the Greek, if you look up the Hebrew, if you look up other types of, uh, uh, of languages, you'll probably find the word internationalist meaning something different in other countries. But it has already done been brought up several different times about his internationalist views towards what he's doing. And because of it, it has gotten himself in a great deal of hot water, even with the prime minister or the president over in, over in Germany, uh, not Germany, but France. <clears throat> it's really become a stepping stone for various people not to be able to get over because of him using this word. That's just one thing that has affected the support in the Donald Trump administration team that has recently come up. Strike two? You can't tell me that there was various groups of people that he should have been around and hung around pertaining to 75 other leaders that was basically there doing the same thing towards honoring the dead, memorializing uh, that in which what had occurred during World War I of a hundred year episode pertaining to celebrating Veterans Day. They use a different name. I don't forget the name that they use, but they use a different name over there. But it means the exact same thing. What's more, different words has different meanings. If Donald Trump knew that he had offended different people about using that word, he should have retracted and said something else other than a nationalist. But the main thing that has puzzled us is that while he was over there, in which I'm pretty sure he's probably back over here stateside now, but the main thing that puzzled us was how would you allow for such fires to break out over in the west of America and text back and make reference to that it was the forestry division's fault that these fires continually break out like this and threatening to stop federal funding for them. You don't do that in the center of a crisis. That would be like saying to all the hurricane victims 24 hours after the hurricane hit, oh, by the way, the United States government is no longer going to function on the same level towards providing FEMA help. Oh, really? What is our tax paying dollars going for? That's the $64,000 question. And if we as a society over here are not smart enough to identify that we've got too many thieves in the pile, too many hands in the cookie jar towards doing stuff, obviously, that they shouldn't be doing, these people should be reprimanded to the fullest extent of the law and go to jail for fraud and for theft charges towards taking advantage of the system. Such as, I'm not going to mention no names, but there's probably, not hundreds, but thousands of major politicians in the past 20, 25, 30 years that has done this. They go into power, basically, as an average working man, with a regular bank account, and whenever they come out, they're worth millions. That's not what the system was set up for. The system was set up to take care of the people. That's the reason why the people are paying taxes, so that their roads can be fixed, so that they can 
uh, redo the bridges that are falling apart so that we can build nice schools and, and, and uh, have uh, entertainment uh, utilities as far as gymnasiums and, and coliseums and stuff like that. Good parks, nice clean lakes and rivers. Something has come in and spoiled this ideology of the American dream. And the biggest thing that has come in is greed. Selfishness. And it's being motivated by sin. It talks about in the Bible, because I am a minister of God, and it's my responsibility to pre-warn the people of the occurrences that are going to occur if they continue to do the same thing. It is my responsibility, as well as other ministers, preachers, evangelists, clergymen, in telling the people that as long as you continue to stay embedded into this sinful nature, we are going to see great, horrible, horrendous sorrows that is going to fall upon to society in such of a degree. It talks about this in different places throughout the Bible, especially the New King James Version over on the new side since Christ come into the to in existence pertaining to signs. That these would be signs that we are to observe and pay close attention to, not so that that we could all run off into a hole to save ourselves. But the signs are placed there to alert us, to awaken us, that if we continue on the same path that we're on, expect more of it. In other words, lesson will be repeated until learned. Apparently, we're dealing with a bunch of people, with a bunch of self-indignation, uh, uh, greedy motives to the point that they are not waking up pertaining to these signs that they're supposed to be seeing. Just like out west, I read a report a while ago that over 6,500 different structures has been burnt to the ground. And the way that I understand it, of uh, the Santa Ana winds that are that are supposed to be blowing 70 mile an hour the rest of the weekend into the beginning parts of the of the week that even these occurrences are even going to intensify possibly towards even more major fires. Years ago, the red man not only feasted upon to the buffalo, but allowed the buffalo to roam its territory. And the buffalo helped to preserve the land. It helped to stomp out the old, the dead, the dry. And whatever the buffalo didn't eat, they stomped it away. And this was kind of like a, a, a purging uh, machine that was going on here in America that would prevent for, from such great fires occurring five, six, seven, a thousand, two thousand years ago. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't have fires, because you know as well as I do, whenever the lightning strikes, a storm hits, and, and, and it hits the right, at the right time, hits vegetation, it's going to create a fire. But as a rule, the fires was not near as devastating as what they are today, especially whenever you add the concept of all the people and all the houses, all the structures. How do we fix this? 
We need to go back to the altar, just as the book of Revelations are talking about as the Holy Spirit is talking to the seven churches. Go back and do thy first works over again, and God will give us the ability towards how to handle not only our resources, but how to handle the problems that are occurring that are supposed to be wake-up calls for humanity, and they're not waking up. And what I am seeing is that these horrendous acts of nature are actually escalating. Instead of getting a Category 4 or 5 hurricane once every 100 years, or once every 50 years, or once every 20 years, now it seems like we're getting one or two of them once a year. Just look what happened to Puerto Rico. Look at the floods. Look at all the, the droughts. Look at all the horrendous uh, weather patterns to where whenever it rains, it rains entirely too much or it don't rain at all. In other words, everything is off kilter. It's out of sync. It's no longer in harmony and balance with, with itself. And the Native American people will be the first people that will tell you that this is occurring. Especially if you go up into the Alaska range where those people solely have to depend upon to the existence of nature. They will tell you, yes, there is something going on not only in the air above us, but something going on below us pertaining to all these tremors and all these other problems that are occurring again and again and again that are intensifying. They're getting worse. We're going to have to awaken. The planet is going to have to awaken because if it doesn't, there may not be a future for our little children and their children and their children's children. Humanity has made a mess out of itself and out of the very thing that we're supposed to be in charge of towards being good stewards. We're going to listen to the rest of this and then we're going to finish this off. But I felt like that this was imperative for my viewers to hear and to listen to, to watch as various things are occurring, not only in the South, not only in the West, but also up in the North. Please listen. The reason we need barriers, the reason we put a double layer fence in San Diego was to keep criminal aliens out of America, illegal aliens out of America. When they put that fence up, illegal alien border crossings in this area decreased by over 90%. I'm going to make another comment. We actually may be cutting our own noses off to despite our face by building these walls, by building these large fences. And the reason why is because if you don't have a wall, maybe you can run the diseased out from the area to keep from contaminating the rest of them who has not yet been diseased. If you build a wall, you're actually capturing the problem that you already have in, inside that can actually become contradictory in you solving the problem. It actually becomes more of the problem than it does the solution to the problem. And to me... The contamination, the invasion of sin that has occurred in society is not just happening in, in a physical form. It's not just happening in a scientific form. It's not just happening on a medical scale form as far as different types of germs. But it's happening on a spiritual form. And until we're willing to wake up and see this invisible enemy that you cannot tangibly see, but you can see the results of what, what the enemy is doing and what the enemy has done. It's kind of like a windstorm. You can't see the wind, 
but you let 110 mile an hour winds come over all those buildings right there and you will see the results from that wind even though you can't see the wind you'll see the results from the wind it's the same way with sin you can't see sin but you can see the results from sin such as divorces child illegitimate births drugs Greed, selfishness, people not caring about the land, not caring about their own uh, neighborhood, not caring about each other. You can see the results from the sin. So to me, building the wall, though it may be good for two or three uh, uh, construction groups that, that wants to get involved towards making money, towards pouring a lot of concrete or building a lot of steel, whatever the, however, what, whatever method that they're going to use to build in this wall, somebody's going to come out on top uh, of this project. But at the same time, is this really going to solve the problem pertaining to what we already have going on here in America? The problem isn't coming. The problem is already here. It's kind of like a storm. A lot of times we can see the storm clouds brewing to the effect that we can take refuge, especially with the high-tech equipment that we have today. We can take refuge because we see the storm clouds brewing. We see them appearing. And because we can see them appearing, we can take refuge. Well, guess what, my friend? The storm is already here. It's not coming. It's not over the horizon fixing to come here. It's already here. So the problem of build the problem becomes even more problematic by building a wall thinking that you're going to prevent the problem by keeping it out whenever the problem is already here. We have to fix what's going on, what's deteriorating, what's become an abscess or a cancer right here. Just like the Bible talks about that you have to clean your own doorstep first. That he who is not faithful over a little things will not be faithful over the bigger things. We have to clean our own doorsteps and get the moat out of our own eye before we're ever going to even consider helping others do the same in other faraway places and other faraway lands. You are now in the most southwest part of the contiguous United States. As you see, this is where the fence enters the water uh, for the border between Mexico and the United States. We call this area, for oddly enough, Bunker. Please don't fall in that three stories down. I don't really want to write the memo. In my America, people think the wall is an enormous waste of money. Why do we need a wall? Um, when you're dealing with somebody, your nanny or, or, or the person that's cleaning, and if they're here illegally, most of those people you're dealing with are going to be good people. So that's the prism you're looking at it from. But that's not everybody. Now, people on the far right will say that everybody is like a murderer and rapist. That's not the whole truth and nothing but the truth either. The, 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 there's an actually a middle which is more honest. And what we deal with down here is cartels and gangbangers and criminals. And we know there's bad people out there that want to do bad things to this country. On um, the southwest border, we arrest 35% of the people we arrest statistically are criminal aliens. They've been in the U.S., they've committed crimes, and they've been deported. Um, in our area, it's up to 70%. You're not seeing that. But it doesn't mean what you're seeing is wrong, it's just saying you're not seeing the whole picture. I'm going to take you to two, two more places, and one is going to show you how it works, having the infrastructure, and one is going to show you how problematic it is when we have no infrastructure. <laughs>
So this is the first location I wanted to bring you, Smuggler's Gulch. The name tells you everything. It's been a smuggling route to this country for 200 years. That berm you're seeing there and that fence did not exist for the first two thirds of my career. So having this here now is where I wanted to show you that the infrastructure is extremely helpful and extremely successful in, in closing off part of the border that was called Smuggler's Gulch. So you think this location is proof that we need the wall? I think it's proof that it works. I'm going to take you to an area next where you're going to see where the Tijuana River flows into the United States. There's no wall there. There's no barrier there. So this is the Tijuana River Valley. And this is what's called the channel. That's the Tijuana River. You probably could smell a little bit right now. There's, there's this mix of sewage and chemicals. But what's really important of this, besides the chemicals and the sewage, is that yellow line is the border. There is no wall. There is no fence. That's Mexico. You just walk in and you're in the United States. So you have to have an agent there. That agent is the wall. You have to waste your manpower of a guy who can't go anywhere. He has to stay there. The minute he leaves, they'll come through. You can't see him, but there's people in here. There's there's, there's a guy right there. What's the guy doing? Hanging out. He's probably a deportado. Somebody was deported. So that guy's just walking into America right now? He's going to hit America in about seven or eight steps. He is now entering illegally into the United States. Yep. There's nothing to Why? stop him there. Why don't we do anything? Why don't you go chase him? Because the minute the agent goes to chase him, he'll run back three feet into Mexico and then throw rocks at us. So what's the point? So the takeaway is understanding the difference between border security and immigration reform, and that there was nothing inherently wrong or evil or any of that about border security. We secure things that we care about. We secure things that we want to protect. We secure things that we love. And there is nothing inherently wrong with doing that. We support legal immigration. We want people that come to this country that want to be here. But if you break into this country, if you break into this country and you commit crimes, you should be deported. I agree with that. If you don't respect this country, get the hell out. Or expect to be deported. That's that's, that's a simple. And I agree towards you shouldn't come here illegally. If you're going to come to this country, you should come as a legal citizen to be documented properly. Where the shame falls upon, it falls upon to the leadership of Mexico, as well as South America and all those little countries down in there. And it's not just Mexico. It's not just South America. It's also India. It's also Africa. These places have had plenty of time to reinvent their system, similar to ours, to where they can keep up with who the bad guys are and who the not-so-bad guys are and who the good guys are. That's the whole purpose for having a Social Security number. That's the whole purpose for setting up a system to where we can now look at your back past pertaining to either your criminal file or your history file, and we can verify whether or not you've ever been a rapist, whether or not you've ever robbed a bank, whether or not you've done this or that or that or this. Over there, they don't have records like that. It's wide open. It's almost like living back in the, in the uh, cowboy and Indian days and... It's really inadequate in every way imaginable because it creates a cesspool of hardship for everybody, including the good people. Including the good people. So if the, if the shame falls upon anyone, the shame should fall upon the feet of the authorities over in other countries, regardless whether it be Mexico, South America, or, or wherever. Because they've had plenty of time to analyze our system, to duplicate it with the courts, with ticketing people, with making sure that they was uh, given shots, uh, immune shots, and, and uh, to eradicate polio and, and tuberculosis. And, and they've had plenty of time to step up to the plate and say, you know what? That system that the American people 
are taking a part of is a lot cleaner, better, sufficient, adequate way to go. Looking at the masses. Looking at the masses. But if you want to continue to be a bunch of hooligans, if you want to continue to be a bunch of wild Indians, per se, people that has not yet been colonized, that's what you got. You got a, one group of people in one country that has one system that has a sense of being colonized, and you have another group of people in another country that has not yet converted over to the same system, and because of it, you have a conflict of interest. You have a conflict of people's dreams and desires and ideals, because not everybody that's trying to make it to the border are bad people. There are a lot of bad people that are coming to America. But once more, we must identify the fact that we already have bad people that are here in America. It's not just the ones that's coming to America that wants to do destruction and damage and hardship and, and, and be mean. It's maybe your next door neighbor. What has done this? you got to be willing to look deeper into the, the point of origin. Because as we have said and we will say again, you're either going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And that in which what feeds that person is called a soul, it's called a spirit. And in that spirit... You're either going to want to fulfill the commandments of God by keeping the commandments of God, or you're going to want to do just the opposite by breaking the commandments of God, by being a mean person. In other words, whatever spirit is within you is going to give you the desire of either wanting to do good or wanting to do bad. That's where the Windmill Ministries comes in at, towards wanting to direct people in the right direction areas towards doing good and the only way that a human being is going to be able to do good is to be born again is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ into their life and start living that life according to the way that the Bible has taught you to live that life in other words don't just allow for Jesus to be your savior but allow for him to be your Lord we got the problem right here inside the wall of the dirtiness of the contamination that has been fostered by greed and selfishness by Satan himself. We're going to listen to just a little bit more of this and then we're going to let go. Attention! Attention! Trump is not racist! No matter how much they tell you, Trump is not racist! And out there, you just preach the word of Trump, huh? Preach it. Well, and, and we do different things. So sometimes we confront the left. Sometimes we infiltrate. We go in disguise. And then we question. Build it. Build it. Donald Trump represented somebody who said, wait a second. My job's to protect these guys. I don't care about you. I don't care about the, the, the special interest. I care about these people. If this wall protects these people... Then build the wall. Fight sanctuary state. So you fight sanctuary state. Build the wall. 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 To me, the wall is a symbol of everything that America is not. It's about keeping people out. You and I do not agree on anything. Yeah. Can we agree on one thing? The Mexicans are not paying for this wall. I don't care. If Mexico doesn't pay for this wall, I don't care. I just want to see the wall get built. I was, when, when I heard Donald Trump say Mexico's going to pay for it, I said, hell yeah, make Mexico pay for it. Now, but they're not going to pay for but it. They, well, they may. They may. No, they, they will may. Not. They may. Not. They may. Wait, what do you think my America needs to learn about your America? Your America is a bubble. We are in the middle of a civil war that hasn't been declared yet. If we can't even secure our borders from keeping criminals 
even even terrorists from coming into our country, we no longer have a country. So for those who say we are not in a civil war, you're blind. There goes a there goes a punk who stole my hat. We are in the midst of a cultural civil war, and the next step will be bloodshed. I'm afraid. These are the fascists here that call us. They call the right the fascists. I go to events to expose the lies, to expose the left for who they truly are. And then they're cowards, and they stand behind their face masks. So you're one of Trump's warriors. You're out there fighting his civil war. You get punched in the face by cowards. Yeah, I'm an American warrior. You get hit in the fucking head by cowards. I went to Berkeley and got hit over the head. Is this what the left believes in? This, 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 this guy. Is this is this justified? So you've shed blood over this Trump civil war. I shed blood. Back up. This motherfucker keeps hitting people in the head with stick. We had the anti-American Marxist people that are trying to undermine this country. They're really, I call them Nancy Pelosi's grandchildren. This is what you get. This is what you get with the left. This is what you get with the left. I think I need to introduce you to someone. Come on, come on. Get your stroller. There's some people I want you to meet. Nancy Pelosi's grandchildren, Nancy ladies and gentlemen. Real grandchildren. Oh. You don't have a mask on today. It's interesting. You usually you guys you guys do stuff. No, you guys are good guys. Good guys. So, so anyway, hold on. I can speak on their mother. This guy said. Is this the setup? Is this the setup? Is this the setup? No. This guy's this guy's work is to, to he's at war. When I asked him if this country's at war, he said he's at war with Nancy Pelosi's grandchildren. What are you guys thinking at? Um, I don't think you would win the war. I, I, oh. I like I like the I like the Why do you hate my children, man? Oh I don't know if anyone really hates me. I don't I don't think they should. I don't want to take out the beach at it, you know? Are you guys violent harvest and leftists? No. No. We're just kids like, we're just kids who like building trucks. I, you know, and I love that you like building walls. I think Donald Trump could use it. Actually needing the true grandchildren gives me hope for the future. That they're not all violent Marxist leftists. It's such, it's such, a, it's such an honor to meet you guys and to hang with you. It worries me that our children have limited encounters with people who don't think like they do. We've become politically segregated. So how do we teach our kids to accommodate each other's narratives? And coexist with people who we don't agree with? Sutherland Springs on Easter Sunday, where they're celebrating the resurrection, we can see how it's possible to heal after a terrible tragedy. It begs the question, how can this country repair our emotionally polarized national life? To resurrect the idea of America as the world's most stable democracy. We can start by listening to our fellow Americans and thinking outside of our own bubbles so that we can attempt to heal what divides us. Amen.